92nd Street Y Online Media is made possible by the generous support of listeners like you. This program features Robert Stone reading from Outer Bridge Reach and Ken Kesey reading from Sailor Song, followed by an audience Q&A. It was recorded on October 14, 1992, before a live audience at New York's 92nd Street Y. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Carl Kirchway, director of the Poetry Center, and tonight it's my pleasure to welcome you to a reading by Ken Kesey and Robert Stone. As you know, we normally make it our practice to ask someone in the literary community to say a few words of introduction for our authors when they read here. Tonight we have the unusual situation of having two authors who have been close friends and colleagues for many years, so the logical thing was to ask each of them to introduce the other one. Um, <laughs> They've known each other since the days of the Merry Pranksters, after all. Therefore, uh, what we will present you tonight is, first of all, Ken Kesey, who will say a few words of introduction for Robert Stone. Robert Stone will then read from his work um, and return as introducer to introduce Ken Kesey. Following Ken Kesey's reading, in our never-ending quest to be at least as innovative as the New Eurekan Poets Cafe, with its poetry slams, we will introduce you tonight to a new form of question and answer session. This form of question and answer session will consist of a device known as an ask it ball, uh, which you will notice resembles a basket ball and which is passed, as I understand it, from one audience member to another who will be asked if they have any questions for Ken Kesey and Robert Stone to speak into a kind of ear-like orifice <laughs> upon this ball. This will no doubt challenge our technological resources here in Kaufman Hall, but we're going to give it a try. So if you have questions for Ken Kesey and Robert Stone, you will have a chance to ask them. I wanted also to let you know that uh, next Wednesday night, the 21st of October, at 8 o'clock here in Kaufman Hall, Susan Sontag will join us to read from her new novel, The Volcano Lover. This promises to be an excellent reading. Um, it will be introduced by Elizabeth Hardwick. Um, I wanted uh, finally to say that uh, anyone in our audience tonight who has a single ticket to the reading we um, would like to encourage you to join us as a Poetry Center subscriber. The cost of the membership is $125 for 34 readings, which works out to, oh, I don't know, about $4 a reading or so. You can't get much better bargain than that. And there are many fine evenings ahead of us this season, including um, between now and the end of December, uh, readings by Gary Snyder uh, and Gunter Grass, among others, and in the spring, readings by uh, Philip Roth, his first New York reading, to my knowledge, um, and Muriel Spark and Umberto Eco. Uh, there will be evenings of verse drama, a tribute to Sylvia Plath, uh, a program about the Vietnam War and American literature. Uh, there's a lot, a lot happening here this season. If any single ticket holders would like to join us as members, the box office will remain open after tonight's reading, and they will discount your membership the cost of your single ticket. So just give them your stub, tell them you'd like to join as a member, and they will present you with a card and give you a discount. I have no other parish announcements to make this evening, so I ask you to welcome Ken Kesey, who will introduce Robert Stone. Thank you. We always called him the Mary Paranoid. In fact, I've always felt like uh, Bob Stone uh, was the first one to come along and make paranoia work for you. Um, there's a couple stories that I enjoy telling, and by way of introduction, it's a good way to get to know Bob Stone. We were in uh, England during the heyday of the Beatles. Um, he had a flat over there, and my wife and I joined Bob and his wife in the flat and used the flat for a while. And 
painted it too, painted it good. <laughs> and Bob and I had invitations to a very special event at Albert Hall. It was the Albert Hall Christmas special. And it featured the Who were playing, the Beatles were there. It was when uh, John and Yoko did the famous thing in the sack. Um, the London Philharmonic uh, Orchestra was there with the, the full chorus. It was a wonderful evening. And Bob has a habit of being very antsy about stuff until the chemicals get to going just right. And you, <laughs> you remember in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof when Paul Newman talks about the click? Well, you can almost hear it when it happens in Bob's tone. <laughs> and it was the closing number. And they had the Beatles, and they had the Who, and they had the Rolling Stones, and they had the New York, I mean, the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and the chorus, and uh, Olivia Newton-John, and all these people got out on stage, and they were singing Silent Night. It was a wonderful thing, wonderful feeling. And up above, at the top of Albert Hall, they begin to shake these uh, big pillows and feathers begin to drift down, simulating snow. And every heart in the house was steered to uh, uh, new heights. At that moment, Bob Stone stood up next to me and, and began to sing at the top of his lungs the German national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> and people on both sides began to move away from him. <laughs> And I realized just before this German national anthem started, I had heard that click. <laughs> and some years later, we had gone to see the uh, an opening of The Godfather at a theater, I think, uh, in Connecticut somewhere. And Bob and I were sitting in the middle of the theater there, passing stuff back and forth. Suddenly, I heard that click, and Bob stood up in the middle of the theater and said, Hey, wait a minute. You can't be showing this stuff like this. You can't be glorifying this stuff. Wait till I tell you what they did to my brother-in-law. They put him in a pizza thing. They cooked him in there. You can't be doing this stuff until they came in and drug him out. <laughs> I didn't know him at this point. There's a point in which Bob Stone is sliding along, and then you realize the man can become dangerous. Robert Stone, let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we used to have a saying when I worked in the carnivals, what's, uh, what's sauce for the geek is sauce for the geezer. <laughs> I, know, it. Yeah. I, I was particularly shocked watching Charlie Rose, Kesey was on Charlie Rose last night, and he said uh, at one point, novelists are a dime a dozen. I was particularly offended. I've always wanted to think of myself as a two-bit novelist. <laughs> but, uh, so. I'm going to read from Outer Bridge Reach. I find the... okay. Oh, this is uh, it's about a man sailing. A man who, uh, who enters a circumnavigation race. And at this point in the novel, he's uh, off the coast of Brazil. At the equator, there were starry nights and glass and useless breezes too feeble to dry sweat or raise a hair. Each morning the sun came up on distant ghostly clouds that never changed their shape or bearing, the same clouds, it seemed, steaming on station day after day. To coax what little air there was, Brown had raised a ghoster jib, a big light sail with a Kevlar luff sheeted to the afterdeck. He spent hours looking over the stern, watching the little mill pond ripple of the current under his keel. The water is, was crazy blue, painted Brazilian. Once a stormy petrel settled safely on the boom to show him how little wind there was. When he approached it, it fixed him with a wise little eye, but never shifted. 
Out of curiosity, he reached his hand toward it. The bird made a quarter turn on its perch and pecked at him. Then it shot off, racing eastward an inch over the surface, as though there were anything for anyone out there. Brown made a log entry. Mother Carey's chicken. One night he turned on the radio and scanned the dial in search of a few sounds. The clown colors of the sunset had put him in mind of tropical riot, sambas, civil and Portuguese. What he got was a religious lady on the customary band. Many of you have written in, said the grimly English religious lady, to ask what is meant by God's covenant. Brown scratched himself and opened a can of peaches and settled, set and settled down to listen. By God's covenant, the lady said, is meant the job that we are meant to do. If the boss gives you a job and you do it and are paid for it, then you have kept your covenant with the boss. But if you do not do the job, do not expect the boss to pay you. God has a job for all his creatures, the lady went on, and we must each do ours, for we are either covenant keepers or covenant breakers. Are you a covenant keeper? or a covenant breaker. You must think about it. If you are not a covenant keeper, then you are in rebellion. I wonder how many of our listeners are covenant keepers. I hope it is very, very many. How lovely it would be if all our listeners were covenant keepers. I hope that none of our listeners are in rebellion. Not me, Brown said. To be in rebellion, the lady continued, is to be alone. It is to be insane, for all reality belongs to God. I disagree, Brown said. We must all remember, the lady said, what we are told in Hebrews 4, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Brown found it curious to consider the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The dividing asunder of joints and marrow was a sight he knew, familiar to him both from the dinner table and the aftermath of tactical air support. One might think of Osobuco, but also of someone's arm impossibly bent, its boiling tubes exposed to flies its red mottled white bone to beetles. Hebrews 4, Brown thought, unquestionably had war and sacrifice on its bloody mind. Overhead, the stars were exquisite and inviting reverence featured the Southern Cross. Let him with whom we have to do, Brown thought by way of prayer, never sunder my spirit from my soul. It certainly did sound like insanity. Let him with whom we have to do have nothing to do with me. When the facts with everyone's position came in, awakening him, he found himself disinclined to read it. It was as though he wanted not to be in a race, which was not to say, he thought, that he wanted not to win one. He actually left the facts unread, except for the section about the weather. Not checking it was a little stupid, but he was in his own house, in his own kingdom, and he supposed he would find out about the others soon enough. Is this self-confidence self or cowardice, he had to ask himself, independence or spite? The church lady's broadcast had put him in a vein of self-examination. He felt as though he might be in rebellion. At dawn the next day, the same clouds were stretched out in convoy along the eastern horizon. The motionless sea changed with the sky from violet to smoky blue. Brown watched it close over his little wake when the heat of the day came on, his rebellion took the form of a refusal to patiently endure another stifling day of calm. The silky glowing surface of the water, its cool blue promise, drove him to action. He paid out a sheet to trail behind Nona, known as the name of the boat, as a safety line, its end wrapped around a belaying pin. The other end he secured to the mainmast. He left a bar of saltwater soap on the afterdeck. Then he stripped, went forward to the bow, and leaned against its aluminum rail for a moment to take a measure of the boat's faint forward motion. In the next instant, he took a breath and dived over. The warm, still water, still, the warm, still water closed welcomingly around him. 
Unresisted, he pushed deep and far. When he surfaced, his head was six feet from Nona's hull. He swam a stroke and put his hand against her skin. He could barely feel her sliding past. Turning over, he swam a few strokes aft, and when the sheet came by, he seized it and pulled himself up to the boat's stern ladder. He soaked himself and did it all over again. The satin water, the rush of silence and surface in his ears, the salt on his lips, all made him feel renewed. When he had played the game for a while, he made himself a lunch of crackers, canned crab meat, and vegetable juice, and went to sleep in the cockpit. By late afternoon, only shifting light had changed the stock-still diagram of boat attending clouds and sea. He went swimming again. It was a drill with a rhythm, a good way of staying in shape. He decided he would keep at it through the calms. Once he broke the surface of the water to find the upper world in unfamiliar shadow. From some quarter of the sky, a cloud had come across the sun. Brown swam on his back, squinting at the sky. He felt himself arise on an invisible swell, and looking over his shoulder saw the ghoster slowly filling, its contours darkening and curving as it puffed out. The boat began to groan. He saw her heave and slide forward, making a sound against the surface like rain and leaves. Then before he knew it, the trailing safety line was rushing past him. He made an awkward overhand reach for the belaying pin at the end of the sheet and felt it slip through his fingers in the growing distance his future life. Nona was sailing on alone, leaving him her new wake. Calmly, he swam after the line in strong considered strokes that increased his speed with every kick. And, that, and fewer, after fewer than a dozen, he had caught the sheet. He wrapped it around his wrist and let the boat's strength haul him for a while. Back aboard, he stood by the transom, looking at the empty sea where he had made an object. Although the flow of the wake went on and the camber of the sail suggested wind, he felt no breeze against his naked body. In the grip of a sudden notion, he hurried forward and dived ahead of the boat again. This time his heart raced, not with a true panic, but with a safer imagined one. All the same, he swam as hard as he could, and when the shear went by, when the sheet went by, seized it with both hands and pulled himself home. He did the same thing again and again until he was almost exhausted. There was no sign of the cloud that had obscured the sun before. Afterward, he lay down again on deck, half sleeping, half dreaming of the shore, childish days in the surf, summer birthdays, and his parents. In his single true dream, the sky had gone dark, and he was swimming in warm water littered with floating straw. He opened his eyes to faded blue. The sun was low. Physically, he felt very tired. He had put his trunks on and was sitting in the cockpit when, on the edge of vision, a shadow like that of a sail passed along Nona's bow. Leaning over the side, he saw that it was an enormous shark just under the surface. The thing seemed unseeing and mechanical, barely animate. Once past the stern, it swerved and came alongside the hull again, this time its dorsal fin broached slightly, silently shearing an inch or so of the breathing world. Brown crouched absolutely still to watch its pass. It was perfect, he thought, worshipful, at home, unlike him. When the shark was gone, Brown found himself discontent. He had never even thought of trying to get the camcorder. When he tried, sitting at his navigation table to describe for his journal what had happened, his swimming missing the line, the shark coming. He could not make it turn out right, nor could he quite manage the thing in memory. Remembering it, he felt both fear and longing, insulted and exalted. In the middle of the night, when the next false breeze came up, Brown shivered and slaked his peculiar thirst with water. The next section I'm going to read from takes place ashore. It takes place in New York at a, in a loft, in a, the loft of a, the man who is making a documentary film on, about this voyage. He's equipping Brown, who's sailing with a camera, with a camcorder, and he's, making, he's, he's at, uh, around Brown's house filming his wife and daughter who are left behind. He has filmed the preparations. His name is Strickland, and the family of the man who's sailing is named Brown. 
One day Strickland was trying to concentrate on his Central American film when some footage he had taken of the Browns came back from the lab. It was a humid, drizzly afternoon with a wet mist over the rooftops that obscured the buildings of Lower Manhattan. He stacked the cans in his workplace. In the next room, where Pamela lay sleeping, a radio played softly tuned to WBAI. An announcer with a mild speech impediment was imperfectly reading the wire copy from Sri Lanka. A great many villagers in one part of the island had been cut to pieces, the corpses and odd survivors set alight. More than 100, declared the leaden-tongued broadcaster. He had a touch of the Elmer Fuds. Strickland had no choice but to imagine the scene on, scene on film. He had once spent two weeks in Sri Lanka, the most beautiful land on earth. The people there were intelligent, humorous, and kind. The event described was one of those from which the viewing public required protection. Nice day for something, Strickland said aloud. He felt at the point of inward riot. I should tell you that Pamela is the, was the central figure in a documentary about escort services, which, uh, which Strickland had made earlier. And he is, they have become friends, as it were. <laughs> On the bulletin board, he had pinned a row of photographs of Anne Brown. He walked over and inspected them. Some were contemporary shots he had taken around the Brown's place or in the boatyard. Some were the prints of pictures that had appeared in advertising supplements over 20 years before, when she had been a teenage model. Her body then had been striking, about as hefty as a model's could be with the slimmest of waists. Her hips now were a little broader and her waist a little wider, but she had managed to maintain the principles of her construction. She had wonderfully long legs. Between her knees and her navel, Strickland thought she was sublime. His reflections were interrupted by the downstairs bell. Looking out the window, he saw Hershey and Jean Marie, Hershey's girlfriend from film school, waiting outside. He went down and brought them up in the elevator. Just in time, he told them. I love your place, Jean Marie said. I've never been here. She was a petite Italian-American from Jersey. She had never been there, Strickland suspected, because she despised his work and dreaded him. When his guests were seated before the monitor, Strickland went to wake up Pamela. We have company. Who's here? Hershey and Jean Marie, now do me a favor and don't try to sell them any drugs and keep your hands off them. Everyone settled in front of the monitor to watch the new footage. Pamela passed a joint around, everyone smoked it. Hershey and Jean Marie had brought wine and some salad from the corner Korean. I don't get it, Hershey said, what are we seeing here? They were seeing the Brown's daughter, Maggie, pacing beside her garden wall in Connecticut. She walked frowning, arms folded, eyes downcast, her lips moved, she was speaking. Does she know you're there, Pamela asked. She believes herself alone, Strickland said, she's addressing herself. Sneaky, Jean Marie said, poor kid. Next they saw Brown himself walking along a chain link fence against a waterfront background. When did we get this, Hershey asked. I filmed it myself. I get it, Pamela said, they walk the same. Pamela Strickland said, there isn't always an it to get. You always have an it, she said. That doesn't mean I always know what it is. Yes, you do, she said, you know everything. But should you be filming them without their knowledge and permission? Jean Marie asked with affected innocence. It seems unfair. What are you, Jean Marie, a lawyer? I thought you were in film school. I am, she said. Well, tell me, said Strickland, should I? Pudov can set a cow on fire. Should he have done it? I mean, who knows? Shit, Hershey said, the entire cow? It's the Siberian equivalent of lobster, Strickland said. Seals in the flavor. <laughs> I don't think it's right, Jean Marie said. They watched Brown on the monitor looking lost in thought, gazing over the lower bay. He looks like Irving Pitchell, Hershey said, in Dracula's Daughter. Everyone was amused. Next they saw Brown groping through what appeared to be the curving stairway of a duplex apartment high over the city. He held his hand out in front of him. What appeared to be a huge red brocade curtain across the window closed out day daylight. I call it, Strickland said, the blind Orion searching for the rising sun. He doesn't know you're filming? He thinks he's in the dark. It's Matty Highland's apartment we managed to get in. I put infrared bulbs in the light fixtures. So, Hershey said, he thinks he's invisible, but he's lit up like Disney World. What's on the walls, Pamela asked. Is it blood? Now he looks like Bruce Cabot, Hershey said. How come you didn't let me in on this, he demanded of his mentor. What am I, some fool from the real world? 
What did you tell him was happening? Jean Marie asked. How did you get him in there? I told him I wanted to try something. He went along. He's an educated man. He appreciates the arts. That's so unethical, Jean Marie said. Strickland was still pondering his previous notion. This is a guy, he told the young people, who understands art. He just doesn't know what he likes. You have to have sympathy, Jean Marie said. I mean, don't you? Sympathy of a kind, yes. Sympathy is funny, it's various. Pamela suddenly began to tremble. Who here saw Lost in Space, she asked. They had like this Aryan fascist family in a nice way. There was this one show, it had a robot and a gay man. It was about an echo from a cavern. It was like so frightening. Does anyone remember? The people in the room ignored her. I mean, Jean Marie said, is that how documentary works? Is it really all right to impose an arbitrary context on your subject and trick them and blind them? Jean Marie Strickland said, all this time I thought you were this nice little dumb guinea. Hershey took the plastic bowl of coleslaw from her right hand before she could throw it at Strickland. Disarmed, she bit her thumb at him instead. When I'm filming Jean Marie, I see it this way. They're the town, I'm the clock. Get it? You think you're the clock, Jean Marie said. Someday, man, somebody's gonna be the clock on you. This last short section takes place on an island in the south latitudes, of 50th degree of latitude, uh, an island which may or may not be there. The sun was 30 degrees above the ridgeline in an edge of clear blue. A massed bank of bitter black clouds had occupied most of the sky. The wind was variable, alternately icy and mild. He took his camera, a marlin spike and the dive mask, climbed into the dinghy and cast off. He stepped ashore on a shingle of flint that shifted beneath his boots. Not far away on the ocean side of the island, he could hear great waves crashing and the hiss and rattle of their retreat over stones. The unsteady wind carried a chaos of birds and a chicken coop stink. He trudged on over the flint, sliding and stumbling toward firmer ground. The disk of the sun glared on the water and the peaks of ice. Brown put his sunglasses on. It was hard humping to the ocean side over a quarter mile spine of delicate ra razor sharp black lava that was riddled with fissures, hollows, and, and fossilized bubbles. The rocks looked to brown like a mold from hell, a maelstrom frozen at a stroke. The going was dangerous once he fell and cut his hands. The nearer sand on the ocean shore was black and soft as dust and he sank sometimes to the ankles. Advancing toward the breakers, he felt at first a sense of liberation Thalassa, he was thinking, repeating the whispered word as he labored over the beach. When he was nearer, the murderous force of the great waves was plain. They threw themselves against the stones with much brutality, seeming to double their strength after cresting and accelerate on the final roll. You had only to watch their coming in to feel the dizzying, suffocating force they contained. Each breaker cast up a, th a thin cloud of debris so that going closer to the water, Brown felt not only icy spindrift on his face, but pebble shards and dirt that soiled his eyes. It made him remember that he was not one of the 10,000 and that the ocean was his prison and not the road home. The sight of it made him sick, so he stretched out and retched it on the sand. Lying there, he became aware of the birds. It was the smell of them, he thought, that had made him sick and not the ocean. There were thousands right at the edge of the soft sand on which he lay. They had black button eyes and yellow crests through which the sun and the spray made rainbows. He stood up and walked over the sand toward them. Penguins surrounded him like wheat. The ground was slippery with kelp and guano and the lands landscape stank to heaven. The crowd of penguins gave way to make a path for him. Their clucking calls filled his ears echoing off the rocks until they made a silence. It was a droll scene, he thought, the Protestant formality of the birds on their icy stone island with the black sky overhead, but the sun's upper limb shone from an icy edge of sky, as though reflected in an index glass. Everything is measurement, Brown thought, everything I see. The sun's rays lit the penguin crests to a thousand colors. Ahead of him along the penguin shore were white shapes in the sun's glare. Ice, he thought at first, coming closer. 
He saw that the white shapes were not ice. What they might be confounded him. At first, they seemed meaningless and without form. Closer up, they assumed a geometry with which he was somehow vaguely familiar. For a moment, his attention was distracted by the sight of a young penguin besieged by skuas. The penguin was alone within a circle of disaster 10 feet in diameter. No other bird came nearer. It was eyeless, although it stretched its neck and strained to face the sky. One leathery flipper was raised in comic rage at things. The other hung bloody and truncated at its side. Overhead, skua gulls were wheeling. Every minute or so, a skua would descend screaming from the wheel to tear flesh from the dying bird. Brown stopped for a while to watch, then turned away and put the back of his arm across his eyes to protect them from the glare. I want a missionary woman now, Brown thought, to make a story out of this. Mother Carey, tending her chickens, God's sparrows falling aslant his gaze. Creatures for sacred, inscrutable reasons denied flight are brought piecemeal into the sky as meat. The white shapes Brown saw presently were the bleached bones of whales. Hundreds of bones were strewn along the beach just beyond the rollers. Penguins wandered among them like the citizens of a town. He walked faster, bracing for balance with his marlin spike. There were fin bones like skeletal wings, head-high pelvic bones and mandibles full of pegged teeth the size of fists. Cages of five-foot ribs were piled like the tiers of a stylized prison to a height beyond reach. The field of bones stretched to the end of the cove a mile in the distance. They were clean and dry. Their contours were natural and pleasurable. At first, Brown was shocked as though he had stumbled on some kind of sordidness or scandal. But the beauty of the scene, the order and grammar of the bones, put his mind at rest. He walked patiently around the next point and saw what appeared to be black towers rising from the beach. The towers proved to be huge vats raised on three metal legs. The rocks here and the scattered bones were all burned black as though by fire. It seemed that the cauldrons had burned out of control. A few hundred yards from the shore was a black metal shed. Brown went closer and saw that it was covered with graffiti. He stopped and stared uncomprehending at the shed's walls unable to assign any meaning to the scrawled words. Onion head, hob, tree magister, seven spirits. There was a trident and the tricolor flag of some nation which Brown, who knew his flags, failed to recognize. There were semaphore characters together with drawings of genitals and odd smiling faces. One of the island's freak winds came up and rattled the metal roof of the building and played one curving wall to the tone of a musical saw. He was aware of darting figures on the ground. Rats, he thought at first, seeing a gray-brown blur. But when he had a closer look, he saw that the creatures were not rats, but small flightless birds that looked like plucked penguins. He thought they were cold rails. There was a stick covered with flaking white paint on the ground, and he picked it up. He wanted to write something on the wall to leave something there. The paint on the stick was long dry, and there was nothing to write with. Be true to the dreams of your youth, he thought. He traced that, word by word, on the black wall with his white stick, although it left no mark at all. Be true to the dreams of your youth. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm here to introduce Kesey, and you'll, you'll note that as I do this, I'm not going to tell any embarrassing old stories about people st staggering around. Okay. I, I first met Ken Kesey in California 30 years ago, around this season. I was then a neurasthenic youth, morbidly sensitive and haughty. I had read One Flow Over the Cuckoo's Nest with great pleasure and admiration, but at that time I had spent most of my brief adult life in the Navy, and I had no idea of how to talk to people. I can't remember the first thing I said to him because I've repressed it. I, I do remember that he thought I was a communist. I think he still does. But. 
And anyway, the world was black and white for me, the color of subtitled movies at Bethalia. Sometime later, I found myself stoned, wearing a pot on my head, waving a neoprene buffer, and trying to hit him on the head with it as part of a two-man reenactment of the Battle of Lake Ladoga scene from Alexander Nevsky. I think I was the Teutonic Knights. Eventually, there were 30 people rolling around the imaginary ice on that balmy California evening. You had to be there. The year I met Kesey was the year I, that I saw Lenny Bruce for the first time, and John Coltrane, and Miles Davis, Neil Cassidy, Alan Ginsberg. It was a very good year. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was Ken's first published novel, his young man's book. It is, and the world knows it is, a wonderful and funny novel, celebrating diversity and freedom. It is a book that will live long, partly because it represents one aspect of the cultural forces that overthrew the strictions of the Eisenhower years but more particularly because its joy in life and language is so memorable. It's a very fine novel, and a more finely tuned and complex one than many readers realize. Beneath its romantic heroicism lies much shrewd observation of the uses of power, much thoughtfulness and paradox. Its setting is a figure of the country in the late 50s. In its pages, one can still see the past and the future intersecting. It is one of the great American romantic novels, filled with the life of its era, and utterly American, a work that could have been produced nowhere else. His next, and in my opinion, even greater book, sometimes a great notion, is darker and richer. Its psychological density is even more intense. It takes on great questions, the nature of manhood, of love, of honor, independence, America itself, the West. It is an enormously vital book, it possessed of great immediacy, sensual, violent, tragic. When it was completed, Ken brought the manuscript to New York aboard the famous bus and entered into the history of the next 20 years or so. He took up farming, went briefly to jail. In his life, he's been spared very little. The rest of us wandered around aimlessly, wondering how it was that a party we had gone to in, the, in 1963 had somehow followed us out the door and down the street and was filling the world with day-glow colors and a taste for all manner of motion, wondering how we could get back to that party, back to the garden. Even now we do. Every once in a while, Ken would produce a collection of essays, garage sale, demon box, that were notable for their empathy and clarity and the rectitude particular to him, which he always had in the weirdest places, in the strangest situations, the toughest times. Until now, the novelist in him has been silent, but this year we have Sailor's Song, which was everything we hoped for with the vision and humor and love of storytelling. Once, when Ken was in Mexico hiding out, I got a cable from him under some absurd moniker. It said, come at once, everything is beginning again. That, that, that was plenty good enough for me, and I went. <laughs> so, so here, with everything beginning again, again, is the man himself, Ken Kesey and Sailor's Song. The Ascot Ball is in that bag. It's going to change the course of publishing history. <laughs> I was talking the other day about uh, sharing and uh, love and all the stuff I usually talk about, and somebody called in and says, do you know, talking about sharing, that the whole course of musical history would have been changed if Mama Cass had just shared that ham sandwich with Karen Carpenter. <laughs> it's an Indian flute. I picked it up at the Siletz powwow. I like to play a little bit of it to begin these readings to give you a feeling of Indianness. 
the Indians are on the rise, if you haven't noticed. They couldn't have stopped the Columbus Parade uh, 10 years ago. Good, yeah, absolutely. At this point in the story, my hero, Ike Salas, is about to fly off to uh, Skagway to rescue the uh, president of the underdogs, Billy the Squid. Ike Salas is known as the Back at you Bandit. He was a famous echo gorilla in the, what I call the nasty 90s. This book is set in the future 30 or 40 years in a little town in Alaska called Kuanak. Um, and a movie company has come up. As I say this stuff about the Back at You Bandit and Billy the Squid, I realize why I'm getting these reviews here in the East Coast. <laughs> it's not like I'm talking about uh, a Marvel comic. <laughs> So Ike and his buddy Greer are about ready to fly to Skagway, and in this piece he uh, reminisces and remembers why he became the Back at you Bandit. I got a big dog named Marley. Ike helped the big border collie down the metal steps. The old dog seemed to be moving a little better, Maybe that outing had helped. He let him wobble by himself to the edge of the oyster shells for a shit. Water dribbled around his paws as he squatted. Ike sighed. Yeah, he might be moving a little better, but he was still unable to lift a hind leg. Those days were over. When Marley came back grinning, wagging his tail, Ike rubbed his ears and let the filming brown eyes stare into his. How's it hanging, Marl? What's the old dog report? The dog grinned a wolfish grin in answer. Ike put the dishpan full of dry food under the trailer and Marley followed it. Ike filled the big plastic bucket at the tap and lashed it to one of the trailer blocks so the old animal couldn't knock it over. Then he pounded on the trailer side, shouting, Off we go, Greer! That's his buddy, a Rastafarian. Greer came down the steps carrying a big Mexican bolsa. The shower had brightened him up. He shook his dreadlocks, singing in time to the spangles of water in the morning sunlight. Off we go into the wild blue wonder. That's wide blue yonder, I corrected as he clambered into the driver's seat of the van. Get in. Hey, that's right, man. I sometimes forget you were also the big war hero pilot, you know, flying high into the sky. Ike drove and let Greer sing. Sometimes he forgot, too, as much as he was able, in fact. But as they pulled into Herb Tom's rinse-a-lot, the look of the old otter he had rented brought a jolt of it back. And when they were loaded into the vintage seaplane and roaring over the waves in a slow, shuddering takeoff, he couldn't help but be reminded of his old night moth, all those clandestine launchings in the offshore mists, all those heroic missions. Of course, the moth didn't roar. She hardly hummed with her big muffled prop and her blimped engine. It was the slowness the two planes had in common. The moth's top airspeed wasn't much greater than the old otter's, but the speed at which she could remain aloft was far lower. That was the aircraft's great innovative advantage. A moth could keep flying speed at six and a half miles an hour, about the pace of a fast-walking man. Once the Navy began to realize that the modern mission didn't need the traditional big bomber launched from the deck of a huge carrier, that smaller planes could be boom-yarded up out of the hold of a cargo ship and set down alongside for takeoff, a swaddle in darkness and silence with the black sea for the runway to infrared scopes for their eyes, then the night moth was the next logical step. It could hum in beneath the radar and put a timer on a precise target and be humming home before the enemy below awoke, or didn't awake, depending on the payload. Usually it was just pamphlets or bogus currency. 
I could drop many a queer million into various Central American states on co covert destabling sorties for the CIA as though any South American state ever needed assistance destabilizing. <laughs> Night moths were difficult to detect and as hard to hit as bats. Even if one was spotted by ground-to-air sentries, the heat-seeking missiles found no jet trail to home in on. Anti-aircraft was useless because they flew in beneath the ceiling of the altitude shells. Rifles were the most dangerous because the moths were slow targets and with a lot of unshielded fuel tank exposure, easily punctured. But even when hit, they rarely crashed. They could set down on a small river or pond or even a meadow as long as there was enough damp grass for the Teflon to skid on. One of the squadron's follow pilots could easily pick up the downed comrade with a quick touchdown. A catch cradle was dropped between the pontoons for this purpose. It could be back in the air before hostile ground forces arrived. I could scooped up three downed pilots this way. One from a narrow slough near Zaire, another from a sand dune outside Alexandria, and a crippled kid from the end zone of a football field in the center of Jerusalem. This kid had been a track star from the University of Missouri, and he was sprinting across the field in world record time. A rip of lead up through his left heel ended that. He couldn't even stand up for the catch cradle. Ike had to land between the hash marks and get out and carry the bleeding boy to his idling moth, then take off from the 50 with a salt slug skipping viciously across the wet turf all around them. They cleared the goalpost just as the kid's down plane self-destructed in a flash of green magnesium. I could see the enraged faces of running Israelis on his rear zoom monitor and hear the machine gun fire. He got the Navy Cross for that one, but was never allowed to wear it in public or reveal specifics about the mission. The U.S. was never officially at war with their old ally, Israel. After gaining altitude into the northeast wind, Ike banked around south at about a thousand feet back over the town. He'd forgotten how much he enjoyed the world from this altitude. Not so low as to be on alert, not so high as to lose the character of the place beneath. The town looked like a big toy. Toy houses and toy streets, toy pickups and boats and water towers, crisp and clean as pictures in a pop-up book from your childhood, sharply familiar. Then he realized with a start that the town looked an awful lot like that cartoon map that the movie company had made. That's what it was. Duck Gutter with its little inland lake looked like a miniature golf hazard. The church and high school looked like mock-ups for a pageant. The tin-roofed crab pot there, for instance, could be the set of one of the far north dish sit sitcoms. Enjoy the antics of hard-living, hard-loving, far-north characters in an authentic Alaskan fisherman's bar. Yep, the old director Steubens was right. Kuanik had a valuable quality that the townspeople were still largely ignorant of, kind of neo-retro. <laughs> they had been in the backwash so long that they had become the forefront without realizing it. <laughs> he tilted a low wing over the trailer house, but saw no signs of Marley. The old dog had probably gone back inside to finish his morning toilet. Ike banked the airplane on around and began a gentle droning climb into the sun east. It always felt strange to him having to fly east to get to places that one just naturally assumed lay south toward the lower 48. Like it always seemed that Los Angeles, say, lay almost in a straight line toward the South Pole, but if one were to fly due south from Kuanak, intending to land at LAX, one would miss California by hundreds of miles and be headed for Tahiti. If you missed Tahiti, you could end up at the very bottom of the world before sighting land. They had a 600-mile flight ahead of them to Skagway. In this old droner, it would take the better part of a day and most of his fuel. He told Herb Tom to call him in a fight flight plan that would loosely follow the coastline by sight, but he had not checked it in over the radio. The air traffic authorities wouldn't be alarmed. Radio contact was too jammed up unless you had the latest secure channels. He preferred it like this anyway, unscheduled in the wild blue wonder. If they ran into trouble, they could always baby her into some little cove. 
The motor sounded reliable, but you could never tell about the weather, not these days. Like the old Vikings who always sailed with a land somewhere in sight, Ike preferred to fly with a body of white water close by. It was a holdover from the night moth runs. Prince William Sound shimmered into sight off to his left, looking perfectly healthy from this height. The only thing that revealed the blight beneath the surface was the paltry number of boats, just a couple of crabbers, some longliners, and a few gillnetters still making desultory sets along the once vigorous fishing grounds, barely a dozen. And this wasn't even an odd-numbered year. This was an even-numbered year. For a while, some good runs had come in on the even-numbered seasons, seasons not affected by the two- or four-year cycle since the 89 spill, but lately those runs had diminished even with redoubled efforts at the hatcheries. There weren't even many tankers in sight. These days, the Dutch preferred to take the longer but surer trip through the Bering Straits to take on oil at the source well. The pipeline to Valdez was still judged unreliable even after this long. There hadn't been any real documented bandit hits in 10 years, but for a while it had been fierce, and Big Oil was still leery about Prince William. There had been bandit strikes on tankers themselves that came steaming into the sound, minor computer jamming usually by radical hackers with virtual dish ends, but some Big Oilers had been torpedoed outright Unmanned outboards were loaded with plastics and aimed in collision course through the dark. You grease us, we grease you right back at you. Of course, these militant acts weren't all the spawn of his summer of vengeful folly, Ike knew. It had been going on long before he got into it. But he had to admit that he was the one that had given them the flag they rallied around. He was the one that had created the back at you logo little suspecting that it would become so universal that for a season it was the third most encountered emblem on the globe, a simple single splat of black in the middle of a yellow and red bullseye. It turned up as graffiti spray jobs on freeway abutments, then on t-shirts and stickers and even balloons. Sometimes the black blot on the bullseye had the word back at you printed in white for the symbol impaired. But gradually, the printed word was dropped. It was no longer needed any more than the word stop or alto was needed in the hexagonal stop signs anymore. I couldn't remember ever writing the word himself. There hadn't been time or room. The bullseyes were the business cards of the spray service he worked for, and only about three inches across, a stiff paper disc of concentric yellow and red circles with the company name in small blue letters in the center. Bullseye Aerial Spray. Call 1-800-AIRSHOT for terms. The black splat covered all that. Maybe he had penciled in the word on a few of the first cards. He couldn't remember. Whatever, it had been enough. The press had seized on the phrase and welded it to the bullseye with black splat symbol forevermore. It could be found illustrated in all the modern dictionaries, sometimes under S, sometimes under B, sometimes under E for eco-terrorism, often under all three. It wasn't something that he had intended or anticipated. There had been no planning at all on his part, no conspiratorial deliberations, nothing unless you count that vague seething that had been smoldering for almost a year like a buried fuse before the blow-off. Almost a year exactly. The blow-off had been less than two days before the Sunday that would have been little Irene's first birthday. It was a Friday noon. I had cashed his check at the airport bank and was driving home in his LeBaron. He had knocked off early in case any of the doctors wanted to talk to him. Workers were still toiling in the heat waves, rippling the vegetable fields. The big picking gantries were chugging along with pickers stretched out, belly down on booms, extending from both sides. He could see the ripe tomatoes flowing like ribbons of blood as they were plucked and placed on the booms' ribbed belts. Other workers sorted and crated the ribbons' red flow. When a gantry reached the field's border, the crates were offloaded onto a flatbed truck, and the big spidery-looking device was wheeled about to begin another slow pass through the crop. It could harvest 20 rows of tomatoes at a pass and haul 30 migrants.
one picker over each ten rows on each side, and ten sorters and craters in the middle. The pickers were men, the sorters and craters were usually women and children. The driver was always a gringo, a timster, high up in the air-conditioned cab with glass on all sides so he could keep an eye on the operation and slow down or speed up according to how that section of the field looked. An experienced driver could increase his machine's daily harvest by as much as 20%. Carlos Bravo, the UFW picket, woke from a deep sleep when the LeBaron pulled under the mimosa and into the yard. He had been napping in the porch shade of Ike's triple wide. It was Carlos's assignment to harass this pesticido pilot. He was supposed to march in front of the Salas' home with signs protesting the policies of the truck farmers in general and the Department of Agriculture in particular. But since Ike was generally working most of the day and Jeannie was either usually in town at the clinic or at her sister's place in McFarland, there wasn't much for Carlos to harass. So Ike told him he could wait in the shade on the porch swing. Carlos stood up from the swing and came forward unsteadily, pumping his sign up and down as Ike eased the LeBaron into the tin-roofed carport. He and Carlos had built the carport on a weekend the summer before, before the picketing had started. They were old poker amigos and joined with other Pendiani friends every other Wednesday night. It was why Carlos had been given this particular assignment. Carlos had been an active member of the United Farm Workers for nearly half a century and was not in the best of health. His breathing often became troubled and he was subject to spells of dizziness, especially when conflicted. So he had requested that he might be given the duty of harassing the pilot, Senor Salas, and as they were already compadres and the conflict would be less stressful. He had been picketing and harassing the triple wide for months without a spell. Puno al cuño a la cabaza hombre, Carlos insulted, pumping his sign. Tu madre es puta. <laughs> Hello, Carlos, Ike said, hauling his sweaty flight suit out of the back. How are you feeling today? Oh, pretty good, Isaac. They prescribed for me some new inhalers. It helps me sleep better. I noticed that, Ike grinned. He tossed the zippered suit over an oleander bush to let it dry. The suits were supposed to be laundered every night, but the washing machine at the hangar was on the fritz again, and the oleander was dead anyway. How long has Mrs. Salas been gone? Carlos shrugged. I don't know, Isaac. I did not see her leave but some long time, I think. She was gone when I wake up from my lunch break. Right, Isaac said, some long time. Jeannie had been spending more and more time at her sister's on the way back from the clinic, drinking wine and smoking black rock and praying. Sometimes he had to drive over and bring her home. Well, it looks like it's just us hombres again, Carlos. How about a beer and some nachos? Sure, you bet. The old man pushed his sign beneath the triple wide's post porch. He'd been storing it there so long that dirt and mildew had all but obscured the original lettering. Only three words were still discernible, dollar and cancer and moloch. I candid Carlos a Corona and drank one himself while he showered. When he was dressed, he carried out two fresh beers and some tortilla chips and took a seat in the porch swing. Carlos had relinquished it for a place on the steps. Across the road in the choke field, the crew was knocking off for the day. They were singing Yellow Submarine in Spanish. And the old man was humming along. He took the bottle from Isaac and sipped thoughtfully. And so, Isaac, my friend, Carlos said at last, how is the little Irene? Lots better, I told him. Chipper. The new shunt they put in drains more effectively, so her earaches have stopped. Still smiling, I bet. Still smiling, I answered. I am glad. Carlos started humming Yellow Submarine again. Irene had been born a spina bifida baby with enlarged cranium and a section of her lower backbone exposed. Numerous operations and skin grafts had covered the flaw, but the fluids in the cranium still didn't drain properly. The shunt would plug. The head would swell up, and the little girl's bright blue eyes would burn even brighter Fibrile, the doctor called it. They were told to bring her in when her eyes looked feverish, especially if she complained of earaches or was holding her ears. These were the only signs they had to go on because the child rarely cried. 
She kept up her brave little smile even during the most feverish periods of flood retention. Nothing seemed to daunt her but the earaches. And Jeannie said the doctors were confident these would diminish as the cranium grew. Ike was glad that Carlos was there at the triple wide, even in his capacity as adversary. He was also grateful that Carlos Bravo had never tried to implicate the baby's birth defect in the farm workers campaign. A more zealous union member would not have let the opportunity pass, even though researchers had assured the farm workers over and over there was absolutely no connection. A zealot would have jumped on the chance, but Carlos was of a more philosophical nature, like Jeannie. Believe in blessings, Jeannie enjoyed saying, not in blamings. In fact, after the birth, when Carlos was fretting if the defect might not have come from him, all those runs over the coke slopes in Ecuador, for example, spraying those botanical recombinants, Jeannie had been the first to reassure him otherwise. Hey, man, tossing back her hair with a bright smile, like Job says, shit falls on the saint and the sinner alike. He went in the triple and brought out two more beers. The workers in the choke field had piled onto the flatbed and were jouncing off along the dirt dike to the field house to turn in their time. The sun had slipped down into the heat waves and was spreading out, red and misshapen, a bloody egg. Ike had just finished the third beer when the phone rang. It's Jeannie's drunk sister in McFarlane, I bet, he predicted to Carlos, rocking up from the swing. It was Jeannie's drunk sister, all right, but they weren't in the kitchen in McFarland. Where were they? She was calling from the clinic in Fresno. Ike should come right away. Could he speak to Jeannie? No, and no, she couldn't tell him more than that. Just come. As the phone buzzed in his hand, he saw the sun split open and something was coming out. And then he felt a cold wind take hold of him, like a hand gripping the back of his neck, pushing him to the eyepiece, making him look. It was blurry for a moment. Then he saw it all, like a thing on a slide under a microscope. Not a new thing. It had been there all along for the seeing. One would have had only to bend down and put eye to the experience. The clandestine flights in the venomous little night moths the pesticido planes, the subversion of a natural process in the name of a bug-free, drug-free, thug-free world. And it works, infinitesimal alterations on the genetic level. And why not? It makes sense. It preserves personnel. It saves money, and it keeps the collateral damage at a minimum. Of course, there was always the possibility that if you mess around with it long enough, you might get some of it on you. The little girl had been dead more than two hours when he arrived at the pediatric ward. Complications, the nurse said. The shunt failed. The wastes accumulated. The pressure popped. Something, something to something, the doctor said. Ike begged to see her despite the doctor and Jeannie's sister's warnings. They said they should go see the mother instead, but Jeannie was asleep, or sedated, zoned out, and Ike wanted to see his daughter. He kept pushing. They gave way. The child was already on a slab in a cooler drawer when they took him to her. She was naked under the sheet, lying on her back with her legs frogged out the way she used to lie while she was waiting to have her bottom powdered. Her little fists were clenched tight. Her mouth was still in the smile, eight toothed now, not at all unhappy looking, but her brow and temples were swollen huge purple as an eggplant. She looked like a thing on a slide. He assured the doctors he was fine and drove home and parked under the mimosa. He went inside and sat down in the breakfast nook. It was dim at this hour, but he didn't turn on the light. The dimness was cool. As his eyes adjusted, he saw Jeannie's little pipe on the tabletop and he lit a candle and fired it up. One jolt was all he'd needed. He had always been that way, one jolt of anything, and he was off, like a toboggan over the edge. A drag off a cigarette could do it as well as this fetid pipe. He always figured that was why he never got hooked on anything. One jolt was enough. When he opened his eyes, he saw the open book on the table by the candle. Jeannie must have been reading here when she was interrupted. 
He expected to find a Bible, but saw it was a book of poetry, folded open at a piece by Ernesto Cardinal, a South American poet, he thought, last century, in tiny print. Gradually, he was able to read the words. Yesterday, I went into a supermarket and saw the shelves bare empty, most of them empty, and I felt a little of the melancholy of the empty shelves. But more than that, a happiness about our people's dignity that's plain to see on the empty shelves. It's the price we're paying, a small nation fighting against the Colossus, and I see the empty shelves completely full of heroism. His face came up from the page, the melancholy of the empty shelves, the dignity, the heroism of the empty shelves. He remembered watching the news coverage of the Mother's March on Sacramento, thousands of women balancing on their heads buckets and jars and pots of Central Valley tap water. They were shown lined out for miles along the shoulder of the highway, barefoot and bleeding like medieval penitents with their water offering to the state legislators. They carried only one sign. If it's so pure, you drink it. That was enough to get them arrested for unlawful demonstration along a public thoroughfare. They were hauled off by the busloads. None of the sardonic gifts of water ever made it within 10 miles of Sacramento and buckets and jars and clay pots were left to drain dry in weedy stretches of ditch, the heroism of the empty. When he had watched the program two years ago, he'd felt sorry for the women. Now he felt ashamed before them. The trailer was too dark to read more, the candle too fluttery. He went into the bedroom and lay down on the unmade waterbed, still dressed, his eyes clenched. The bed folded around his shame, dark as a wallet comfortable as a cloud. Small wonder he had never wanted to lean his eye to that eyepiece. He had always feared that the casualty he found there would be wrapped in the stars and stripes, in a cheap, lying, dirty banner made in Korea. He would see through the magnifying lens the flaws in the flag's fabric, the signs of irreversible unraveling. A faulty equation must have been allowed to creep into the intricate formula of warp and woof at the Korean flag factory, or had been planted there on purpose like a recombinant virus. Small wonder you didn't want to lean down and look close. It was your flag unraveling, the one you'd fought for, invested in, life savings. Small wonder you shouldn't want to watch the flaws grow monthly more obvious. Cancer, childhood cancer in McFarland, 400% higher than the norm, just for example. He remembered reading the statistic. Back page, one column. No connection proven, of course. No connection? What the shit? Were we blind? So many kids from around McFarland go to the Fresno Clinic that they use carpools. Carpools. The water rocked him, and the cloud took him, and he slept. He awoke at seven in the morning and had muffins and coffee in the nook and then drove to the hangar as usual. The flight jobber told him to take the day off and rest, for Christ's sakes, but I begged to be allowed to work. They told me at the clinic it was best to go on about your business. I need to fly, Skip. I'll take it slow. Don't worry. You go into the office. Tell them I'll be ready for the noon run. The jobber shrugged and left Ike. Ike sat down in a swivel chair and stared at the spread of assignment sheets. Some of the pilots dropped by for a few muttered words of sympathy on their way to the field. He nodded at them and said he was all right. He'd be along in a bit, soon. He sat in the deserted hangar for a long time. He had no idea what he was going to do, no plan whatsoever. When the field outside was empty of the bustle and roar of tank-ups and take-offs, he walked to his old Cessna and he looked at it. He had always loved the look of his airplanes. There was something both predatory and gentle about these old prep j prop jobs, like fat old hawks. The leaky hydraulic seal hadn't been fixed, he saw. The engine was still dripping oil onto a pile of newspaper, one drop every 10 seconds, no big problem. It didn't leak in flight, only when it had been sitting long enough for the seals to cool and shrink. Then it was regular as a clock, one black drop every 10 seconds, six a minute. 
He watched it drip a while and then went back to the hangar office. He took a roll of the round business cards from the phone stand and returned to the dripping airplane. In half an hour, he had a drop of dirty grease in the center of every bullseye. 180, six a minute, regular as a clock. He still didn't know what he was going to do, not until he saw the sucker truck drive past the hangar's open door on its way to the farmer's facilities across the field. When the truck came driving back from its chore, Ike met it, waving his arms. I need to borrow your truck, Oho. What for? The driver stuck his head out the window, suspicious, until he recognized Ike. Oho was a kin of Carlos Bravo, a grandnephew or something. He was about 20 years old with a fat face and a silly mustache, elevating the corners of his mouth. For about a half an hour, hombre. For 20 bucks? Hey, for sure, Isaac. Just don't try to go to no fast food drive through They don't like it. 20 minutes later, Oho had his truck back, and Isaac was in the air, winging toward the Madeira County Fairgrounds. Madeira was the best he could hope for this time. He wasn't sure he had the fuel to make it all the way to Sacramento with his load. He reached the park just before noon. He made one reconnaissance pass to study the wind and the wires, staying at about 1,000. A gaudy swirl of happy young families could be seen flowing through the gates into the midway below. It was under 10 day with a Dairy Queen special. An empty DQ banana boat Sunday cup got you a free ride on all the under 10 rides. The kids were hauling in the used cups by the bags full. Out over the packed parking lot, Ike banked the Cessna sharply back around and down. The fairgrounds came up fast and clear. Piece of cake. The Ferris wheel was right on the near border of the fairgrounds and lit up like a marker pylon. Ike grinned as he bobbed over it, tail wheeled nearly in the seat of the screaming topmost car. Then he nosed down and hit the flaps and the spray cocks. All he could see in his rearview zoom was an elongated scroll of panicked faces streaming away horrified behind him. He throttled up over the rodeo stands and jammed the cocks closed. The gauges showed he was still more than half full. He banked around. This time the swirl of families was no longer happy and gaudy. The midway looked like an anthill after a squirt of raid. And this time he was able to see the faces head on. The horror was still there, but the panic was subsiding. He emptied clean as he bobbed over the Ferris wheel, feeling the satisfying rush of lightness, of emptiness, and on the third pass over, leisurely now, to dip the wings and drop the cards. He saw that the crowd now knew what they were being sprayed with. Their initial expressions of panic and confusion were now entirely purged by a new phenomenon, a new face, outrage, fist-shaking, rock-throwing, finger-giving, outrage. Brown-stained mamas and papas and carnies and kids and all were bobbing up and down beneath him like turds in a turbulent cesspool. His dispersal had been beautiful. Not a one of them but was somewhere besmirched. He just wished that he'd made more cards. He was home in the triple white again, asleep in the unmade waterbed, still fully dressed again, only with Jeannie beside him this time, also fully dressed in her sedated state, when the Fresno sheriff and about a dozen deputies came knocking. Jeannie woke up enough to open one eye as they were leading him out in the handcuffs. What is happening? She managed to inquire. Go back to sleep, one of the crisp young deputies told her. What is happening? She screamed, the deputy grinned. Unknown county fair terrorist captured, details at 11. It turned out to be a lot more than details, and by 11, Ike Salas was no longer unknown. He was well known. A local TV crew had been covering the Kids' Day special, and the fly-by footage played big. Lurid close-ups showed the screams and panic of the first fly-by, the disgust and outrage of the second, then the final insult of the calling cards. The conscientious TV crew had traced the plane's number and had uh, arrived at the vegetable fields while the sheriff was still interrogating Ojo Bravo. Sure, I savvy, Ojo had told the TV cameras. I know what Isaac Salas wants with my truck from in front. Hey, his little baby just died. He got pissed off, just like us. Do I think he is a terrorist? No, 
I, Salas is maybe what we call a bandit, but he is no terrorist. He's just a bandit that got pissed off. Anyhow, what was it he did was so terrible, huh? He got a little caca on some upper middle class. I get the same thing on me every day for under minimum wage. <laughs> Ojo's eyes were crackling and black when he spoke, and his silly mustache quivered with passion in the close-ups. The interview was so effective that it played every time the spray footage ran. By the time Ike was out on bail two days later, he and Ojo Bravo were both world famous and out of work. <laughs> Not that this kept them from repeating their smash act. It just meant they had to wait for the signal from other migrants that the coast was clear and the Cessna and the honey wagon was available. Ike was able to hit the Stockton County Fair a weekend later with, <laughs> with the Cessna's ID number taped over and the state fair in Sacramento the next Friday before they hauled him in again. They didn't bother with Ojo Bravo this time, just Isaac Salas. And this time there was no bail. The back at you bandit would await trial with his wings clipped and his ass incarcerated. By then, however, a legion of similar bandits had arisen to carry on the effort. It was an exciting summer. Thank you. John, are we working, Howard? You guys can hear it? Okay, you know how it works. You talk right into the ear of the ask it ball, and when somebody else wants to talk, pass it on to them. Who wants the ball first? Larry Bird, back there. <laughs> Please say hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Oh, it's working. You give it a little more sound. Hi. How you doing? I got a question. Fire. I want to know who you're going to vote for this year. <laughs> well, I didn't like him at first. I thought anybody's running for president since 1969. You can't be trusted. But after seeing him play the sax, I realized he did inhale. <laughs> How about you? won me over to. <laughs> Go ahead. I understand in, in your logo that you didn't inhale, you just didn't exhale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's building up. <laughs> <too>. <laughs> yes, when you want the ball, just holler for it like you're on a playground. Uh, Turn Mr. the ball up a little bit more if you can. Mr. Kesey? Um, What's the significance of the combine in the book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Of the combine? Yes. Well, that's the villain. That's the, uh, people always think that uh, Big Nurse is the villain, but no, it's the, it's the combine. Uh, it's an evil force above Kissinger. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, does the combine have anything to do with the society? Uh, yeah. It does. <laughs> nice pass. It was a better catch. Mr. Stone, when you, when you said the last line of your reading, I promised myself I wouldn't forget it. But a little bit's passed since then, I forgot it. I wish you'd repeat it again. <laughs> if you want Ken to get your book for you. Be, be true to the dreams of your youth. Okay. Thank you.
Whoa. All right, uh, are we on here? All right, this is a question for either one of you or if both of you can answer it. In terms of, uh, you know, the 60s and, and, and the way the writers were influenced and what kind of works came out, do you feel that there's some kind of substance missing from the generation now from young, young writers and, and, you know, what direction they're going into and if there is really a voice or a common cause that, that can unite them the way you guys were united? Speed. Just kidding. <laughs> Superficial answer. Yeah, I, I, I feel like we're coming into uh, a time where literature is going to have to do more of this and have to have more of that ball. It's going to have to go around and confront the skateboarders eyeball to eyeball. If we don't, Coca-Cola will. Uh, Who are today's heroes? Who's your heroes today? I, this is more in your line than, than mine. I, would never, I like to think of warriors instead of heroes. I believe that, uh, that we are really interested in warriors. The fact that we're here shows that that's what we are interested in. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how much we already know about warriors. Of the 10 great warriors of this century, one of them happens to be a first lady. Who is that? How do we know that? You know, how did we know that? And, and they had this convocation of uh, scientists uh, in which they were all trying to decide which was the, the greatest invention of the 20th century. And they were talking about the cyclotron and the computer and the laser. And somebody at the back of the room stands up and says, it's the laser. I mean, it's, it's the thermos. And they, they ignored him, and they went on talking. Pretty soon he stood up again, and he said, it's the thermos. They said, wait a minute. Come on up here. We're talking about the 20th century. More great inventions in this century than any other century. How can you say it's a thermos? And he said, well, you know, when you put cold stuff in a thermos, how it stays cold? And they said, yeah. And when you put hot stuff in a thermos, how it stays hot? And they said, yeah. How do it know? How do we know that Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the ten great warriors of this century? It's because we've been studying it. That's why we read these books and eat these sprouts and meditate and take long walks. It's not just to join some new age club. <laughs> oh. Uh, I didn't really have a question, but maybe uh, Kesey could ask Stone a question. Ask Bob a question? Yeah. Why not? think. Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Let's see. What's a good question, though? Uh, um, okay, let's get... What did you think when you noticed that the fronts and the backs of our books are very much alike and the insides of them are dealing a great deal with the same subject? Did that give you that weird little feeling in the back of your neck? <laughs> I remember that weird little feeling. I always remember how things began to dissolve uh, and become very difficult after. So I kind of just put it out of my mind. Altogether. Yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Basketball up there in the, in the balcony. Come on, toss it up there, up top. Yay. That's four points from there, if you can hit it from there. Before we get cooking, both. Mr. Stone, can you see yourself writing Abby in the near future? Say again. Writing Dear Abby? Uh, writing Dear Abby? Yeah. Can I say, uh... <laughs> Let's imagine we were required you mean, to. You mean, you mean asking advice of her? Or do you mean writing the column? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah, I have, I have problems. I have a few problems. <laughs> Every once in a while, they become more than I want to handle alone. And it's occurred to me to write to. <laughs> I meant well, Abby Hoffman. <laughs> Mr. Kesey, Sir. does this mean sooner or later we'll see you in the TWA, or one day you'll be with Greyhound? <laughs> well... 
I'm working on a kind of a TW Greyhound right now that uh, <laughs> if I can get the right fuel, I think I can get the big sucker off the ground. <laughs> Mr. Kesey and Mr. Stone, both of you had two great novels that a lot of people don't read too much, or maybe they do, Dog Soldiers and uh, Sometimes a Great Notion, both of which were incredible. Mr. Kesey, I'd like to ask you two quick questions. One is the piece that you did on John Lennon for Rolling Stone, has that been collected, and if so, where, and if not, do you ever in intend it to be published for those who might have missed it first time around. And secondly, is spit in the ocean still out there happening? Um, yeah, Dog Soldiers is a great book. And uh, I thought it's interesting about Dog Soldiers and sometimes a great notion both, is they changed the titles. Two good damn titles, and they changed them, changed Bob's to Who Will Stop the Rain, and mine to not even never give a inch, but never give an inch and uh, all that old stuff that we're still working on see these little yellow cards here those are my son's flyers uh, he's got all that old footage and the acid test footage and uh, everything is still laying there in a pile and composting beautifully it, you can get it by writing a letter to my son because nepotism is better than nopotism at all <laughs> <laughs> go ahead on the Was there a question? Was part of that question for me? <laughs> it was a half of it. Where? Yeah, right. I wanted to know if uh, the Lennon piece that Mr. Kesey wrote back. Oh yeah, it's in it's in Demon Box. I'm sorry. It's in Demon Box. Also, yeah. do, are you still publishing or have any plans to publish Spit in the Ocean Literary Magazine? Nag, nag, nag. <laughs> they never leave you alone, do they? Yeah, we got one left to do, and I'll do it. I swear before I die. I promise. <laughs> Okay, there's a, can you, okay, can you catch it? Here it comes! Go ahead, fire. That is my work habit. <laughs> Well, you use whatever pen you can pick up, and some, <laughs> sometimes it goes all the way through your head. <laughs> in one ear and out the other. <laughs> up in the balcony, uh, could you comment on glory for us many anonymous warriors? Okay, I'll give you a, a what I call my shit floats, cream rises uh, scale. It's a way to delineate your thinking because you already know what we're talking about. Shit floats, cream rises. Over here, you've got Frank Sinatra, Woody Guthrie, <laughs> Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, uh, Reba McIntyre, Joan Baez. Tommy Wolfie? Hunter Thompson. Now there's a warrior. Um, and it's a way that you can know who are your allies. And, and you know, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, which is the warrior? We know, we already know. And the thing about warriorship is it means you have to rise up out of nationalism, out of any kind of religion, feminism, ecology, rise up out of that stuff. It's just the way they're turning us against each other. A warrior doesn't have any dogma. He just tries to be fair. My dad used to say, we don't know what's right, but we know what's fair. We know what's fair, and, and when you don't fight for what's fair in your community, pretty soon you become part of the enemy. Uh, we, I worked yesterday over in Harlem reading to a hall this big full of kids they bust in from all around the city, um, uh, homeless kids and kids from detention center, and it was a bitch, it was hard work. 
and it was a din of stuff coming from up there. And I, afterwards, talking to these teachers and these administrators, you look them in the eyes. Those are warriors. You know them. They're around. If you could do it all over again, how would you have made uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or sometimes a great notion differently? How would you mean the books? I mean the films. If the you film, could do the films. Well, um, I, uh, I never, I've never seen Cuckoo's Nest. I got in an argument with the uh, Hollywood lawyers one time because they wouldn't pay me. <laughs> uh, fancy that. <laughs> they kept saying, trust me, trust me, which is the way they say, fuck you in Hollywood. <laughs> uh, so I, the guy says, you'll be the first in line to see that movie. Because I'd written a screenplay. And I, thought I, was gonna, I thought we were actually going to do something uh, harsh. I wanted to do uh, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, and they wanted to do Hogan's Heroes. Um, so I've never seen that. But I think uh, Sometimes a Great Notion is a fine movie. And as I've watched it uh, more and more, I think that drowning scene in that movie is one of the best scenes ever filmed. Absolutely great scene. I wouldn't do anything differently. If I had to do all over again, I think I'd do it all over Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? I don't really, I, I, I sort of go off and on on the question of evil. I think probably it doesn't exist as such. I really tend to think that uh, the idea of mankind, humankind in depravity, this is a hardcore Calvinist or Jansenist attitude, resolves that. I don't really think there's anything out here other than us. And I think that while you can bring forth a great deal of violence and despair and ruthlessness and cruelty from one person, it still doesn't quite make it to the metaphysical dimension of evil. I, we, we are all that is here, I think. So. I don't, I don't think I recognize evil, only an infinite number of singular, bad, hateful actions. Holy is present, but I probably, in, in terms of the ancient tradition, not to be spoken about, very difficult to isolate and define. I mean, this is, I suppose, this is all in Job. But uh, obviously I'm rambling, so I will stop rambling. <laughs> Give over. On the other hand, I think there's a snake in the grass. Uh, and I'll sh show you some of the ways I think it manifests itself. Um, We've got more people incarcerated in this nation than anybody in the history of the world. We're sticking people in jail faster than you can believe, and we're hiring more cops, and we believe that cops will do it. There is latent in the controlling philosophy in this nation the idea that certain people have born in them the desire to go out and knock over a 7-Eleven store. I don't believe that. I believe that hatred and prejudice and bigotry is taught. And I believe it's taught us by the evil force. And I'm not sure 
where it lies, somewhere above Kissinger. But uh, I have seen too much evidence of it to think that we have just bumbled along and got ourselves into this uh, predicament by our own folly. I believe there's a snake in the grass. that are about books of mine? Not, not, not officially, only those two. Uh, one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do you call this? You call it, uh, uh, right, WUSA and Hool, <clears throat> stop the rain. <laughs> Cool. Stop the rain. The, 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 uh, the uh, result, what I took away from my experience with Who'll Stop the Rain is that never begin a movie title with a Swedish diphthong. Hul! Hul! J-U-L. Wait a minute, get this asket ball down to this guy. I didn't bring this thing all the way to New York just to go. I, we, we're old. We can't hear very well. Speak to it and then get it back down here. Can. Yeah. Are you tripping your brains out? Have I cooked my brains out? Do I seem so? Are you tripping your brains out? Am I tripping my brains out? It's hard to know anymore, you know. <laughs> could we, could we have, could we, we, we're down to the last two questions. Yeah. Uh, two more. Now come on down here. This person with the green has been waiting a long time. Down on the floor with the ball. Can you catch Can it? Can I ask you a quick question? Okay. Hi, uh, Mr. Kichi. In, um, in Demon Box and in a garage sale, you you wrote about two um, notebooks that were lost uh, when you were arrested that were confiscated and not returned. What, what was written in them? What kind of stuff? Oh, the jail books? Jail stuff, you know? The, uh, a lot of it went to Viking and, and some of it's still in, in jail. They, they, they took uh, the really juicy stuff, uh, but it's, it's no great loss. Get that ball down here to this guy in green. I want to see if you can catch it. Hard th Oh, look out! <laughs> if it survives this, we'll be doing well. Mr. Kesey, um, this, this uh, question is a little bit um, irrelevant, but it's somewhat germane. Um, <laughs> seriously, it it's, it's, um, it, pertains to, it pertains to music. It's a musical question. Um, I know that you've traveled with, with the Grateful Dead, and I want your personal opinion um, to settle a bet. Uh, um, do, you, do you feel that, um, that the talents of Jerry Garcia and Pigpen um, are anywhere near the talents of Jim Morrison? Well, Pigpen and Jim Morrison have a lot in common. <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> One more, one more question. Over there. Uh, where do you spe speak into this? The ear. I, um, the ear. Did you know I'm, that was the most used word during the 60s they would studied? Did you know that? Ear? I didn't know that. Ear. Ear. Oh. Ear. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, I'm just curious about seeing the two of you up on stage. You obviously um, have very different styles, yeah, and I'm and I'm curious to know two things. One is, how did when you first met did you know that you were going to like one another? And the other is, you both now live in different coasts, and how much in touch are you these days? And and what was it that when you first met that brought you two together? About the other. That's a good question. That's um. Well. I didn't know that I was going to like uh, Bob Stone when we first met because uh, he did look like he had a bomb concealed in his bag and was uh, planning to <laughs> blow up the uh, House and American Activities Committee. And I, by that, at that time, I wasn't as, as radical. But uh, he said a thing about me one time. He said, Keezy, you're trying to take the 20th century by the tail like a dinosaur and throw it over on its back. And uh, I said, will you help? And he said, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
Yeah, no, we had a very uh, we had a very awkward initial encounter. I, I've, uh, as, I, as, I, as I've said, I didn't know how to talk to people. I really kind of repressed the minutes of it. No, I, I think actually we we really uh, uh, disliked each other considerable considerably on uh, on the basis of, of our first conversation. But uh, we, we we overcame it by degrees. Uh, what was the what was the other? Uh, do we? One one thing we have in common. We were just. Uh, out eating, we've both been married to the same, uh, not to the same woman. <laughs> I've been married to the same woman, and he's been married to the same woman for a long, long time. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, I advise young writers. You need help. You need a mate. <laughs> and we've had two really uh, super helpers. and. Is finally I got around to dedicating a sailor song to Faye and uh, Faye and Janice over there. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thanks a bunch. I'll leave you to the words of two of the great warriors of our time. I'll give you their first rule. Anybody wants one of these flyers to write to Zane, come get it. The first rule, and you guys will know the second. The first rule is, be excellent to each other. What's the second rule? Party on. Party on. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on 92nd Street Y and all of our programs, please visit us on the web at 92y.org. This program is copyright 1992 by 92nd Street Y.